Okay, so this is legal risk of reporting security vulnerabilities. Um, uh, again, I, as I said, I'm Scott Jones. I'm also involved in Electronic Frontiers Georgia. It's a local activist group. And uh, we were involved in the fight against uh, Georgia Senate Bill 315. And Senate Bill 315 is not the only thing in the horizon that could possibly um, uh, you know, threaten security research. Um, but we do have our panel here today. If everyone could introduce themselves and uh, let me know what your, what, what your connection is to this topic. Uh, hi, I'm Ron Daniels. I'm an attorney down in middle Georgia. Um, my connection to this topic is I represent a lot of consumers with data privacy issues. I've also represented an uh, individual who reported a couple of years ago a large data breach to the Secretary of State's office and had to defend him and some issues that rose up with that. My name is T.J. Myhill. I'm an attorney here in Atlanta. I practice in business and technology law and litigation. Uh, I, as you guys have probably seen me here a number of times in the past, and I've spoken on uh, on the Georgia bill and other topics uh, related to security reporting, risks, legal vulnerabilities, et cetera. So. Hi, uh, my name is Kevin Bankston. I'm the director of something called the Open Technology Institute, which is an internet policy nonprofit uh, in D.C. In the long, long ago, I also worked at EFF. Uh, and have done policy and advocacy work around uh, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and other related security and hacking issues. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Kurt Opsahl. I'm the uh, Deputy Executive Director and General Counsel at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, a nonprofit organization dedicated to defending your rights online. Um, and one of the things that I work on there is called the Coder's Rights Projects, where we advise uh, security researchers on the risks associated with conducting their research and uh, disclosing their research, uh, trying to find a, a way for people to increase the, uh, the available knowledge about security vulnerabilities uh, without uh, exposing themselves to uh, unnecessary uh, uh, legal risks. So we have counseled uh, many uh, security researchers um, and uh, uh, most of them, well, we can, we can get into the more of the substance uh, at a later point. We can talk about some of this. Also, the Electronic Frontier Foundation has been uh, uh, advocating for reform in, in hacking laws with the uh, Federal Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. We're also uh, trying to rally uh, support for the, uh, the veto of SB 315, which did happen. So. Uh, thank you. If anyone in this, this room has participated in that, thank you very much. Um, I will try and make sure that uh, if we can't uh, hopefully get, get some of these uh, laws better, we can at least stop them from getting worse. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Amy Stepanovich. I work in an organization called Access Now, which works internationally at the intersection of technology and human rights. Um, and I manage our, our office in Washington, D.C. We have 12 offices all over the world. Uh, we see digital security as a necessary prerequisite to the free exercise of human rights in the digital age, and we see the ability to, um, without fear of criminal prosecution, reveal um, vulnerabilities in software as necessary for digital security. Um, so we've been working on these issues for quite some time now, both in the U.S. and, and around the world. Okay, I wanted to start off with the first question. Um, what is, what is ethical reporting from a legal and policy perspective versus not ethical reporting? And why would people ever want to report publicly anyway? What, 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 are, what, are, their, what are their goals in doing that? Who would like to take that on? Uh, all right, I'll, I'll, give that, uh, I'll give that a shot. Um, so ethical reporting, or some people refer to responsible disclosure, or sometimes uh, a popular term, which I think captures it pretty well, is coordinated disclosure, uh, focusing on the coordination you might do with a vendor. All of these are, are various names uh, for a process by which if a security researcher has found a vuln of uh, uh, disclosing it to the vendor, uh, perhaps also to CERT, the computer emergency response teams that are in uh, many countries and, and states. Uh, and why would you do it, of course, is to uh, 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 hopefully to get it fixed, right? You're, you're disclosing it to the vendor. So, you know, the paradigm case is the researcher finds the bug, discloses it to the vendor, 
uh, gives the uh, says I'm going to go be talking about it at this conference coming up. The vendor then in the, in, in the meantime fixes the bug, and then the bug is revealed uh, in the in the researcher's talk. But by the time it is revealed, it has been fixed, so it can't be exploited. And that's sort of the the trade-off that is involved in. Uh, the disclosure, if you disclose it publicly before it is fixed, then it's possible that someone may exploit this when they may not have exploited it before. Uh, however, that is not, it's not always the most ethical thing to, to go through that process. So there are times, for example, where uh, the bug may be so dangerous that the ethical thing is to report it uh, immediately so people can stop using that project, uh, uh, that product until the uh, the bug is fixed. Is there an example of that, Kurt? Um, why, Amy, did you have an example you wanted to put in here? Well, I feel like EFF recently It's early and I'm still working on my coffee, so I want you to say what you're talking about. <laughs> um, with with pretty good privacy email, PGP email, EFF recently. Uh, the email. Um, disclosed immediately to the public prior to patching. Um, the existence of a vulnerability, so people who are at risk using that service um, would know that it was not necessarily the most secure service to continue using um, because of the existence of that vulnerability. Uh, sure. Well, uh, thank you for, for bringing that up. Yeah, that was a, a team of uh, researchers uh, came up uh, and discovered uh, a bug, actually to two bugs, uh, more, more than they found bugs in the pretty good privacy PGP and end and encryption tool for email and also SMIME, which is a another encryption protocol used for for email. Um, and the uh, the researchers actually they, they disclosed it to the projects who were working the PGP various PGP projects. It's an open source piece of software, so there are a lot of pieces to that. Um, and they uh, presented uh, the paper on it. Uh, uh, earlier this month uh, at the Usenix Security Conference, but in the meantime, a couple months ago, um, they disclosed it um, with, with EFF's uh, help, um, and uh, uh, one of the challenges was to, to do that sort of trade-off between letting people be aware that this could be exploited and getting people to uh, you know, protect themselves. Uh, and and getting it fixed. Some some aspects of it actually had been mitigated at that point, but not all. Uh, and one of the challenging things with with uh, some of the the disclosures is it's hard to disclose without giving away the bug. So there, the the initial disclosure actually didn't give away a path that you could just like take the paper and go exploit it. But once you knew where to look. Uh, people were figuring it out rather rather rapidly, um, and that can be sort of a tension. So one of the things that, that researchers might do when they're disclosing uh, something, especially if it is un unfixed, is give sort of the proof of, of, of concept without giving all the necessary details to, to replicate it. But there's also some, some risks in that, in that uh, uh, if people uh, know where to look, uh, can concentrate research in that area, and so, so this gets out, and it was it was a bit of a bit of a trade-off. In this case, the the bug was such that uh, if you uh, uh, received a malicious uh, email, uh, that email could use you decrypting the message to also decrypt other messages. So they would be able to get plain text access to uh, previous messages. Uh, it was uh, a little bit hard for average uh, folks to exploit because a necessary prerequisite would be that they have your previously encrypted messages, which uh, unless they had been targeting you a while back or they were a um, global state-sponsored adversary who was sitting on the network um, who might have access to all of the encrypted uh, messages. Uh, and we don't know anyone. I don't know, but there's this interesting building out in Bluffdale, Utah, that stores uh, a lot, a lot of data. Uh, and uh, I believe, yes, the, the NSA uh, has, a, has a policy that if something is encrypted but they can't yet decrypt it, then they will hold on to that until such time as they can decrypt it. So they may have a lot of uh, encrypted uh, messages there. Um, 
so anyway, I guess those are those are some some of the the challenges with uh, doing uh, 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 disclosure. Okay, um, I you know I may send this down the table, although I, you would probably won't be one of the first people I would think of to ask uh, uh, for this question. But uh, I wanted to get somebody to talk about the CFAA Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, and what is the relationship? That goes back to the '80s, but. What is the relationship between that law? What is that law? And what is the relationship to ethical reporting? Does anybody else want to take that on? I'll do, I'll do a very brief one. Uh, uh, Kurt probably has done more work recently on the CFA than I have. But uh, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, um, who wants to guess what movie helped inspire the passage of this law in the 1980s? I know, I know. War Games, yes. Um, and that's actually a plug for my talk at 5.30 about the feedback loop between science fiction and real world tech and policy. Uh, please join us. Um, so CFAA uh, basically criminalizes and creates civil causes of action, that is uh, an ability for someone to sue you for uh, unauthorized access to a computer system or access in excess of authority uh, to a computer system um, with some pretty uh, hairy penalties. It is a federal crime. Um, and I think the interesting question is, in terms of the relationship between the CFAA and disclosure, it's not a direct one. The crime is actually the breaking into the computer, the discovering and exploiting the vulnerability if you did that. Um, uh, and it's in the disclosure that you might be admitting to having done that. And so then it becomes very critically important, well, did I actually violate the law or not in discovering this vulnerability? And unfortunately, um, the law is fairly fuzzy about what constitutes an access what makes it unauthorized or not? Is it only a violation of the law if I actually circumvented a technical countermeasure trying to keep me out of the program? Or did I violate the law if I ignored their terms of service in terms of what's allowed uh, in interacting with, with their software? Um, you know, and the answers may differ depending on which federal jurisdiction you're in, uh, which um, is worrisome because you don't want to have to be <coughs> like reading a lot of case law to figure out whether uh, whether your red, red teaming is okay. Um, but, so, but so that is the fundamental risk of reporting. Um, the fundamental legal risk is, of course, that you are going to violate the law and or someone's gonna sue you for violating the law, whether you did or, or not. Um, and that could be under the federal law, that could be under a state uh, CFAA clone, that you know, there are state level uh, criminal, uh, criminal um, uh, hacking statutes as well. If you, if I, I was just going to jump in and say exactly that. The, the, the federal law is fuzzy, is a good word for it. I mean, it really does not give you any real clear guidance on what those authorizations or access or use mean in, in a real world situation. But the reality is that states have taken their own initiative on that to copy an already fuzzy law and most times make it even more ambiguous. I mean, Georgia's got one that's, uh, the Georgia Computer Crimes Act is, is probably even more obtuse than, than the, the CFAA. It, it, it really does penalize potentially someone who sits at a computer and opens a program they weren't supposed to open. It's, it's written very broadly to cover all the crimes that we might want to catch, but in doing so, a lot of these statutes catch behaviors that they never intended. So that's the, that's the reality of these statutes, is they are written so broadly because you want to cast a wide net for bad behavior, the crimes you're trying to punish, but it makes it very difficult for you know, even even the lawyers on the table to know whether or not your behavior would violate the statute. I just want to add a, uh, an anecdote on this of a of an interpretation that was a more direct connection between the CFAA uh, and uh, and disclosure. So this was a case I worked on probably ten years ago. Some MIT students had uh, done some research on the Massachusetts Bay Transit Authority, the subway provider in, in, uh, in Boston, uh, on their fare system, and we're going to uh, uh, do a talk about that at the DEF CON conference. Uh, and they you know, were in touch with the MBTA beforehand, and, and things uh, were, were looking, looking well, but 
but then it, it sort of shifted into a, a, a adversarial direction uh, the weekend of the conference, uh, and the MBTA was sort of panicking and uh, went to a, uh, a duty judge, which is sort of the judge who's stuck with uh, dealing with things that happen over a weekend, uh, to get a temporary restraining order to stop the, uh, the talk. And their theory was that the um, language in this uh, uh, CFAA, which talks about uh, causes the transmission of a program, information, code, or command, and a result of such conduct causes damage. Um, so many people would have thought of that as being like sending malware or something, you know, sending uh, uh, a program that would then execute on someone else's computer. They said, hey, it says information on here, and so giving this talk was knowingly transmitting information uh, and was covered uh, uh, under the CFAA. Uh, now, this uh, uh, turned out to be uh, wrong, um, the, uh, though they, they, they sort of got what they wanted in that uh, the, the duty judge uh, uh, did uh, put a temporary restraining order that was enough to stop the talk for that weekend. Uh, we were able to get it lifted within 10 days, but of course that was the 10 days in which the talk was going to happen. Uh, on, on the other hand, uh, and, and this is something that, that is also very... Uh, commonplace in uh, disputes as between researchers and vendors, uh, the efforts to stop the information from being transmitted resulted in far more attention to the problem than uh, had previously been there. So like probably in the ordinary course of things, uh, uh, there might have been some tech reporters who, who included this talk in their write-up of what happened at uh, uh, DEF CON, but because uh, uh, of the MBTA's action, it became front page news on the Boston Globe and on the TV, and uh, uh, we, we turned the, the, the talk time into a press conference and so on. Uh, and so this, this brought, uh, highlighted a lot of issues uh, with their fare system that they might have wanted actually to sweep under the, under the rug. Um, and just to bring, I think, the first question and the second question together a little bit and talk about something happening, um, a conversation happening in DC right now, Senator Warner has introduced a bill um, specifically on Internet of Things devices, and in it he wants to include a carve-out um, for researchers who are conducting security research on IoT products that are contracted for by the U.S. government, so things that the U.S. government is buying, purchasing, renting, potentially. Um, and one of the issues they're having with that is almost exactly what Kevin said, which is that the behavior they are trying to not fall under um, the CFAA looks exactly like the behavior the CFAA <coughs> is trying to get at right up until the point of disclosure. And so how do you define in law, which is, we all understand what this looks like in practice, but how do you define ethical disclosure in law to get at the underlying activity at, before the disclosure happens. Um, what makes the hacking itself okay if you don't know if the person's going to disclose the bug or utilize it until they disclose the bug? Um, and that's an active conversation that bill is pending in Congress. They tried to um, bridge the gap by talking about good faith, um, which is a pretty okay solution, although that's gonna be litigated frequently, I imagine. Um, but that, that legal part of it, needing to write into a sentence what that behavior looks like becomes really difficult to try to create some carve-outs to this very broad statute. And I'll, I'll just add, there's, a, there's an interesting double bind here. Um, because the law is so vague, and yet many people recognize that disclosure of vulnerabilities is a social good that we want to encourage, um, you have different relevant parties starting to draw their own lines in terms of what they'll come after you for or not. So for example, you have a lot of companies that now have bug bounty programs where they will pay you either in money or reputation or in a nice t-shirt that said, I'm the guy that found this bug in Firefox. Um, and they will sort of lay out, we promise not to come after you civilly under the CFAA so long as you like stay within these guardrails, including like don't mess with our customers' private data. Um, but them making that promise and that promise coming into effect when you submit to them doesn't necessarily protect you from the feds if they want to criminally prosecute you. And on the other hand, we now have the DOJ 
Also recognizing the importance of this activity, starting to try and come out with some voluntary guidelines for its prosecutors in terms of what it will and will not prosecute uh, to try and create some space for this kind of activity. And yet, even if the prosecutors uh, forbear and choose not to prosecute you, that may not stop the company involved from suing you for it. Um, so it's, it's hard to get at both of those risks in a comprehensive way without actually changing the law. Hey, I, I had a question. This is a, maybe a little bit tangential. Uh, what are the legal implications of having private sharing information? So say you're a company or an entity and you have a vulnerability and you share it with an ISAC. How does that differ from being publicly released and being released in a private form? All right, I'll go for that. Uh, so just to sort of, I mean, an overview might be pretty, pretty helpful on like, um, so look at two parts. One is the, the research and the other is the disclosure. The legal risks you face are by and large all about the research. The disclosure tells people that you've done the research. So if your disclosure involves admitting to a, to a felony, you may have some legal risks with the disclosure, but they're actually because you're admitting to the thing that you had done before. So in, in, in that case, like if you have uh, uh, obtained a, a, a bug in a, in a manner that you know, does not violate the CFAA, um, you know, for example, you do it on your own uh, computer, you, you work at a vendor and you're like hired to do it uh, by the vendor and so everyone's permission is involved, right? then, then the disclosure doesn't raise those, those kinds of, of issues. Uh, a tougher thing is if you're a researcher and you have pushed some of the boundaries of uh, the law and what authorization you had in discovering the bug, but now you feel like, well, nevertheless, the world would be better off for those knowing about it and how to navigate those waters to do the right thing in the sense of trying to get this, this vulnerability patched and fixed uh, without leading to, you know, having to uh, admit to uh, things that, uh, uh, you know, you might get in trouble for and, and working out that, that balance. And sometimes the companies will be cool about it and appreciate that you've provided them the vulnerability and you can do this with a private sharing. I mean, in some cases, because of the fear of the prosecutors, Kevin was saying the prosecutor can make an independent decision, but maybe if you're not publicly disclosing it, the prosecutor doesn't have that. Um, so you can you can sort of like work out these things, but on the other hand, uh, the vendors sometimes get get upset, and this happens. Uh, one of the, the 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 factors that makes it seemingly more likely is how much that vendor's industry is used to the security vulnerability disclosures. So if they're like a tech company, software maker, they've been around for you know. Uh, 10, 20 years of, of having people find bugs, report the bugs, they fix the bugs. Then the next one is like they know exactly what to do. They have a security team in place. They may have a, a, a whole a bug bounty program, a reporting vulnerability website. They're all set to handle it. But when a company has been making toasters for a long time and has never thought the word sort of computer security previously, and then someone saying, you know, I can make your toaster explode and burn down a house, uh, they may see that as like a threat as opposed to, oh my God, you need to fix this. Uh, and also they may see this as affecting their sales, like who's going to want to buy a toaster that could blow up and burn down their house. Uh, and so they want to squelch that, that information and then you get into a conflict situation uh, and they may say, okay, your disclosure of how you were able to you know, have this toaster explode well, you were also, you had done this uh, CFAA violation, some other thing, and so you better, you better not go forward or we'll bring the hammer down. Kurt, I just want to follow, you, 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 you don't want to correct anything you said, it's all really uh, correct, but the, I do want to make sure that we discuss a little bit about the additional risks. I mean, the CFAA is what we've been focused on. I'm sure we're going to talk about it a lot more, but there are other there are other statutes that you can also get sued under, like the DMCA or other other things that that can cause you problems from the uh, the vulnerability side when you're actually doing the research and and the access of the systems. But there is risks with disclosure too, and it comes from the the toaster company. the The problem with disclosure. 
aside from the fact that you're potentially admitting to the to the federal crime of, of, of violating the DMCA or the CFAA or some other statute, state statute, et cetera, is the disclosure itself might cause some civil, I don't want to say liability because you're probably not liable, but civil lawsuit against you. Uh, companies have brought claims for defamation for revealing these bugs. You, you, you sue, you, 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 I'm going to sue you because you say my toaster is going to blow up and burn the house down. That's terrible. No one's going to want to buy my toaster, just like Kurt said. That's, that's defamation. That's tortious interference with my business. That's disclosure of private information. That's disclosure of confidential information or trade secrets. They may not be successful on any of these claims. Defamation, for example, is not you can't bring an action for defamation if it's a true statement. So if you can prove that it's true that your toaster will blow up and burn the house down, it's not a defamatory statement. And that's a fantastic thing once you've gotten that verdict in your favor after paying me thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to defend you against it. it, it, it Which really you all does, recover. Right. It really does become a, a, a risk in and of itself. Whether you're liable does not change the reality of litigation risk, because litigation risk is is me in my wallet. Well, and, and to, to add to that, Georgia actually has a specific statute. If a company is gathering third parties' information, say it's keeping your Social Security number, your home address, and they have a data breach, you'll say you find a vulnerability. You get in there, you say, hey, look, you got this. They have a legal requirement to notify people that they've been breached. And part of that is they also have to certify that they've fixed the breach, which means they've got to make sure you no longer have access, which may mean they sue you to find out that you no longer have access. They may subpoena you to come to court and say, I no longer have access. They may want a technician to look through your computer, uh, which I wouldn't recommend ever letting anyone do. Uh, because I'll tell you too, the other thing, usually with a federal investigation, it's not the thing that they originally thought you did that gets you busted. It's the tax evasion mm -hmm. or it's something else. Um, you know, it's not that you were violating the TOS of a website. It's the other thing you did they found when they started looking in that. Okay. Um, yeah, I wanted to move on. Although we covered we, we covered a, a bunch of this already, um, so uh, let's see. We talked about CFAA. Are there any other uh, relevant laws? I've heard of old stuff like trespass and chattels, sometimes being used. So from kind of from the range to of old old laws to maybe very new stuff. Um, and we talked about the civil risk quite a bit. If there's anything else you want to add, but that was also the next question. So there are a lot of laws outside the United States, as it turns out. Um, the EU, for example, has both um, EU level and member state level laws that are um, fairly hostile towards security researchers. So there are not only, um, if you're doing this research in the United States, there are not only potential penalties in the United States, but if it involves um, an entity that has a foundation in Europe, you could be getting international um, liability. Um, Argentina took recently um, in 2016 a really hostile approach to security researchers. They actually decided to criminalize any research into voting machines um, under penalty of prosecution um, as they were switching to electronic voting. So they both contracted to switch over to electronic voting machines while simultaneously saying if you conduct research on those machines that they will prosecute you. Um, so just to open up that it's not only a U.S. issue, um, there are some good laws outside the United States. The Netherlands continues to come up as a positive example. They recently put in place a manifesto um, that private entities could sign saying they wouldn't seek prosecution um, if you complied with certain disclosure processes and asked for private entities to sign on to that manifesto. I think when they launched it had 30, but it's gone up from there. Um, so there are some good things too, but just a note on the international piece of this. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask about um, bug bounties. So bug bounties, are they really making things better? Or are they making things worse? Um, what's often happening with the bug bounty is that you're you're executing some kind of agreement that, that has a confidentiality 
um, aspect to it, and that always opens the door that you're contracting with somebody who could bury the information, and then what happens in that case. So what do you guys think about bug bounties? Uh, all right. Uh, on the whole, I think bug bounties are a positive uh, uh, development. That, um, and, and just to go over a bit of what the bug bounty is, it's a, a term for types of programs that uh, various uh, uh, vendors will run where you can uh, report through their mechanism of a vulnerability that you found, and then they will pay you a bounty for that. So for the Electronic Frontier Foundation on our website, if someone reports a vulnerability, we have a program, we'll give them a nice t-shirt. Uh, it's not, it's not, uh, well, it's worth a lot of just karma, but not much money. Um, but other, you know, of a more extensive one, I think, you know, uh, uh, Apple, uh, if you find uh, something that will get root on a, uh, uh, you know, fully patched uh, iPhone, they'll pay you like $200,000 for that, which is a substantial amount. It's also substantially less than the black market will pay. Uh, so, you know, uh, it is uh, a, a bonus for, for doing uh, disclosure to, to the vendor. Uh, it is not designed to, like, financially compete with the, uh, with the black market, but uh, still provide some of the stuff. And for some people, uh, that's a bit of their, their living as they go and, and find bugs and report them through, through bug bounty programs. Uh, other aspects of the bug bounty program, one is that they uh, are uh, providing authorization. So a lot of the hacking statutes, uh, state and federal, uh, without authorization is a key element of the, of the crime. And so they may be authorizing certain activities so long as you keep within what they authorize. Um, so uh, so there, there's, there's a lot of those things. Uh, I think you know Scott was was uh, bringing up uh, uh, well. What if you know the the, the bounty program uh, said uh, then you can never speak of it again after you disclose it, uh, and that's going to vary from from bounty program to bounty program. So uh, <coughs> uh, uh, for for most of the sort of the big players like uh, you know Google and Facebook and such, if you disclose a, a bug through their program, they're not going to uh, require you to never speak of it again, and they, they may. Uh, want to have a time period. Um, Google's uh, Project Zero um, uh, uses 90 days as, as, their, as their benchmark. Project Zero is actually on the other side of that. That's Google's project to find bugs and, and report them and uh, go to 90 days. So, uh, but uh, you know, each, each bug bounty program will be different, have different aspects to it, but as a whole, um, it, it is a useful thing and uh, if nothing else, a bug bounty program at least gives people a point of contact, a way to reach out, a, a sense that the company thinks that bugs are something that they need to find out about. Um, so uh, uh, one of the most frustrating things for a lot of researchers is they, they find a bug, they want to report it, and there's nothing but a like generic customer service line to report it to. Uh, I mean, I'll Bug bounty programs are important and necessary in part because without them, the only avenue for someone with a bug is to either just publicly disclose it, which, which could put a lot of people in danger, or to sell it on a black market where it'll then be resold to states, criminal networks, be used for a lot of bad things. And we don't want that. Um, and and as, as Kurt says, the bug bounty programs can't and won't ever really be able to compete directly financially with the amount that you could make in the black market. Um, but uh, I analogize it to like the decision between bit torrenting and using legal downloading in the sense that like you could get a lot more content by bit torrenting and get it for free. But if you, you know, if you stream it or buy it on iTunes or whatever, you know, one, uh, you're cabining your legal risk. You know what risk you're taking. Um, and two, uh, you get to feel like you're being a good digital citizen. Uh, and so, uh, so bug bounties offer that outlet um, so that we can hopefully divert more bones away from this black market that isn't going anywhere, unfortunately. As you do these things, though, remember that you are creating a contract with your with, with, with with yourself and and the the bounty entity uh, you are agreeing to do certain things you know the, the bug bounty will say you're allowed to do X or you're not allowed to do Y or you know it, it sets out some boundaries 
which is good because then you do know what's allowed and what's not allowed, unlike the CFAA or the DMCA or the other things we've talked about. It gives you guidelines, but bear in mind that those are the guidelines. And if you step out, <coughs> well, then you're violating all those things we're talking about, but you're also breaching your contract. So there, there, are, there are limits that you can put on, on, on things when you're doing that research. Just pay attention. If you're going to engage in any of these, there may be confidentiality restrictions. There may be restrictions on what you are authorized to access, what you're not authorized to access. Your system, your, you purchased our product, anything like that. The, the, you've got to stay inside the lines if you're going to stay on the right side of the law. And, and there's most likely going to be some sort of arbitration provision. I mean, there's going to be a lot of fine print. If you're going to get into a bug bounty situation, you need to look over it. I mean, it, companies like to sneak things in the stuff. You, you all know that. Um, <laughs> it's no different when it's a piece of paper. Well, and just a word on what bug bounties do at the societal level is that they kind they start to counteract the chilling effects that the CFAA, that the state laws, that the international laws put on security research. And so, when you're very hostile legally toward people conducting security research. What that does is it takes people who might conduct security research and it makes them rethink um, whether or not they're going to do that. Um, and it might not for people who are planning to sell things on the black market because they're planning to make a lot of money at it, but for people who are just wanting to disclose that information, do the right thing, if the pro of doing that is very small and the risk of doing that is great um, being put into prison, you might not even conduct that activity to begin with. And so bug bounty pro programs start to bring it back and say maybe this, we will not go after you and counteract that very hostile environment that's the status quo because of the existence of these laws. Okay. What, um, I also have a question here about third parties like HackerOne that kind of builds on the bug bounty, but in this case you're not dealing directly with the um, with the vulnerable party, you're dealing with a third party, and, and with situations like Hacker One, where you, you, you're going through a third party, how does that change things? Uh, does that make things better or worse? All right. So uh, Hacker One, there's a couple others, the Bug Crowd. You know, there's there these companies that uh, are basically a third party bug bounty uh, service provider. So there, the notion is that uh, uh, they, they work with various uh, vendors, set up a program where the bugs are reported through, uh, through HackerOne or BugCrowd or, or whichever, um, and then they'll, they'll report it. Uh, right. So, uh, uh, so the, some of the some of the I guess the the advantage of that is that uh, it, it sort of standardizes things a, a, a little bit. Uh, uh, you can sort of sign up for an account with with HackerOne and then uh, I'll go through you know uh, what what vendors are available through that. You know maybe focus your your research. It also means that a a company you know who's interested in starting a bug bounty program can just like call them up and say hey we want to do this. Uh, and and then sort of like have it in place pretty quickly as opposed to trying to figure out how to uh, how to do it. Um, you know, uh, it's, it, it is it is fine. It may make a lot of sense for smaller companies that where the operational uh, aspects of uh, running a bug bounty program might be uh, uh, prohibitive. Kurt, I'm not familiar with, uh, with with that type of entity. Is there something that could be done with that to remove some of the other risks as well, the disclosure risks? Can you disclose through a third party that would limit your notoriety or liability? Um, so, I mean, we're talking about, so in, in terms of the, the disclosure risks, I mean, so one, you were talking about things like defamation and whatnot, that if you're going through the, the bug bounty program and, and go by the terms of it, I think your, your risk of facing like a defamation lawsuit is going to be very, very low. Sure, sure, sure. I was wondering if there was a way to, to utilize a, an entity like that hacker one to, to allow for disclosure of outside of bug bounty uh, a situation to allow uh, a little more anonymity for the researcher. So, so uh, yeah, another another aspect uh, in terms of mitigating risks that you have, and um, 
uh, is to disclose anonymously. Um, and so uh, uh, this might be, uh, I mean, I don't know specifically if uh, HackerOne makes that sort of readily, uh, readily available, but uh, it certainly can be, can be done where you disclose the bug to a, ser a service provider of some sort, and then they disclose the bug to the vendor as coming from an unnamed researcher, right? So sort of creating this, this barrier. Uh, now, if the if the vendor gets all suey, uh, they may still like you know try and subpoena and get the uh, the information. Yada, but it's a barrier to them. And remember, well, as, uh, as we were just discussing, you know, litigation is expensive. Even if you win, uh, it's uh, you know mutually assured destruction is expensive for them as well. So uh, if they have that additional barrier and 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 such to uh, to finding out, maybe that is a, a, a good sort of mitigate the uh, the risk. Another thing is to uh, uh, operate through uh, your lawyer uh, in the sense that then uh, some information that you've provided the lawyer might be protected by privilege. So it'd be a little bit harder for someone to burst through that uh, that firewall uh, and, and find out who the the underlying person is. Uh, this is, of course, assuming that you have a lawyer with you at all times. Highly recommend it. Uh, for, for the record, we also recommend that. Yeah. Right, 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 right. We're awful. <laughs> okay. Um, so, what what is what would be the ideal policy for encouraging? Responsible hacking and allowing for whistleblowing and and also in the case of civil law uh, if we had a hackers bill of rights What would you put in it? Well, the the the, the, the ideal situation would be law that allows for Ethical proper research and disclosure the problem is that what Amy am I, am I, maybe not, maybe sounds like not. The problem is what Amy said earlier the the behavior is identical up until the bad part so it makes it very, very difficult for a law to be written that says it's okay to do this, but not that, without having it hinge on things like good faith and things like intent. And we'll all tell you we can make we can make a lot of hay out of intent statutes. It, it, it's it's very difficult to prove what someone had in their mind when they were taking some action several months or several years before. So it, it, it does become very difficult to write a statute that makes this okay. It becomes very easy to write a statute that makes it not okay. And that's not a direction I think anybody wants to head, not just in this room, but, but politically either. We, we do recognize generally, I think, big picture, that, that this is a beneficial program. But, you know, that's obviously not universally the case, as we just showed here in Georgia, where we tried to make it even more restrictive. Luckily, the governor vetoed that, but a veto means it got to the governor. So it, it, is, a, it is a very easy thing to write a restrictive litigation. It is a very difficult thing to write in a litigation that allows for proper research behavior. I'm just, the, oh, sorry. The, just, the best thing you can do is be active in your political your own political sphere, locally, statewide, nationwide, to to try and get that done. So uh, go go ahead. Sorry. One of the things um, we brought up good faith again that we were pushing for in the Warner Bill is it should not only be on the researcher to show that they're acting in good faith. I think the company should also have to show that they're acting in good faith. And there have been a lot of examples that have been provided by people on the stage of companies who are clearly not acting in good faith when they go after these researchers, when they're just trying to keep information quiet, when they don't want to have their reputation damaged, um, when they're going after people for retribution. Um, and so having that obligation on both sides, I think, is actually incredibly important. Um, the other thing is to make sure that people aren't trying to cheat people out of bug bounty programs um, by using the threat of litigation, and I think that was something that we were worried about with the, the carve-out in the Warner Bill. I just wanted to, to add, a, so CFAA reform, and, and you could you could apply this reform to the, the state level uh, additions as well, um, this, is a, this is a very uh, critical thing. We have not really had much 
uh, luck in in getting that reform. But uh, just to to uh, go over some of the things. So EFF uh, uh, has put together a, a proposed reform package. We've been uh, putting this out for a while. It's called Aaron's uh, Aaron's Law in in honor of Aaron Swartz, a uh, internet pioneer and, and uh, sometimes security researcher who uh, was prosecuted for uh, uh, getting some access to scholarly materials that, uh, well, he had a right to, ha uh, to see, but maybe not in the manner in which he got it. And tragically, uh, he ended up committing suicide while he was facing 35 years uh, max penalties from a CFAA charge. Um, and so a lot of these things would be trying to deal with it, like what is uh, authorization without authorization. I think it would be very good to clarify that doing something uh, uh, in violation of a terms of service or a end user license agreement is not uh, enough to uh, be criminal uh, behavior. Um, to uh, focus also on um, making a hacking law about hacking, so it should be about like getting around technical. Uh, barriers to to entry. Um, so if you're allowed access to innovate to, to information, uh, if you access it in an innovative way, like that, that should not be uh, a, a computer crime. Uh, and then another thing, and thing probably that will would be the most important in terms of trying to uh, encourage security research, lessening the r risk of researchers, uh, is uh, uh, looking at the penalties that. Uh, uh, the penalties for CFAA violations are uh, can be quite severe uh, for for something that uh, um, you can charge uh, multiple things for. They can bootstrap so that uh, the same action uh, can be charged twice, and then you use the fact that you did two things to uh, increase the penalties further, and so on. That the the penalties can can add up very quickly, uh, and this this creates a tremendous uh, sense of risk. So if you you know you think you got a great case, so you know if it comes up, you're you're feeling very confident what you're doing it, but you're like it's only 95 percent that you know if I ever got there, I would win. Yeah, it's a pretty high level of confidence. But would you want to take a one in twenty chance that you're looking at thirty five years in jail? That like the the the, the harshness of the penalties uh, creates a where is appropriately very cautious. It also means that if, if if there is something and you're bargaining about it, then there may be you know that the the vendor has that kind of leverage to to put that risk on you. Uh, and uh, just sort of as a, as a final aspect of the pitch for why we would want to have uh, more realistic and more uh, uh, nuanced um, penalties is if you look at some of the top uh, cybersecurity professionals who are the chief security officers at, uh, at companies who are uh, you know, in, in the government, in the private sector, leading the, leading the field today, and if you ask them what they did when they were teenagers, you will find out that many of them may have violated the CFAA. And luckily, the statute of limitations allows them to talk about that a little bit, uh, a little bit more. Uh, but uh, you know, one of the things is, in, as the Hacker Manifesto once said, you know, my only crime was curiosity. People were getting into systems not to do damage, not to cause harm, but to see what was there. Uh, and uh, you know, you might say as a society, we don't want to say carte blanche, go for it, but you might also want it so that is like a misdemeanor that is not going to derail someone's uh, entire life, because uh, oftentimes these people go on to do ama amazing things that are uh, tremendously socially useful. Okay, uh, just real quick before I go to Q and A, um, I, I brought up George's uh, SB three fifteen. Is there anybody uh, who could who could talk about it? I probably should be the one, but I want to see if <laughs> somebody else would like to talk about it and and just kind of what happened and, and where we went with that. Well, Scott, I, I, I'm happy to talk about what happened and where we went, but why don't you why don't you do the bill? I mean, you guys obviously knew the bill much more than, than any any of us up here. So. Uh, George's uh, the SB three fifteen was uh, it came out of. Um, the election systems controversy that we had, and uh, we had somebody who uh, found some information that was out on Google that shouldn't have been there. And so, um, this is not somebody who who broke into an election system or anything like that. They just found information that was 
um, that was left open so that Google could index it, and then it, there was a lot of personal identifying information about Georgia voters in that information, and they attempted to report it ethically. And um, so there was a partial fix that was made, and, uh, but it didn't fix everything. So months later, it was still out there. And so they tried to uh, report it again. And the second time around, um, the, uh, there, there's a lot of political context behind the election systems. And the reporter actually got investigated by it. And uh, they called in the FBI, and the FBI investigated, and they actually gave the, the person who did the ethical reporting a clean bill of health. So you get a clean bill of health from the FBI, that's a very powerful statement. But the political forces in Georgia were not happy with that. And so they wanted a law to be able to charge somebody who essentially embarrasses the state uh, <laughs> for, for, you know, for, for disclosing something that, that was really bad for Georgia voters. So they went and passed, a, um, or they didn't, they, they, they did actually go pass a law. They, they, they brought th uh, through the legislative process a law that uh, was close to an anything we don't like kind of bill. It was, uh, a without our authorization bill like the CFAA in some ways it was broader and we uh, you know with uh, Electronic Frontiers Georgia we engaged with that bill and, and we brought up some objections and we got a few carve outs on it we got a terms of service carve out so that it would be criminal only not civil um, but we still had a lot of concerns about it um, so uh, we we went through with that unfortunately the bill passed all the way through the process um, in terms of being passed by both the House and the Senate. And you know, we went through all these committee meetings and everything and were unable to get it stopped there. So our last best hope was to go to the governor's office and try to get the governor to veto it. And, uh, and throughout this process, we pulled in a lot of industry players um, who were engaged in security research and they saw this as a bad idea. And as we brought more and more parties into the process, uh, it gained more and more opposition, and finally we had enough opposition to convince the governor to veto it. So it did get vetoed, um, and that, that's kind of my point of view on it. Well, and, and, and that's it. That's what we said earlier. The problem is that it got vetoed. Okay? It got there. It got passed. It passed the House. It passed the Senate. It, it was, uh, I already mentioned Georgia's Computer Crimes Act. It is a very, very broad act. I mean, there, there is... I don't know that there is 60% of the cases on my desk have nothing to do with the Computer Crime Act, but I could probably make a claim for it because of the way the statute is written. It, it, is, it is a very broad and very actively used statute already. And to add in additional restrictions and additional, like I said, it's easy to make a, a law that's even worse than we've got now. Um, so that was... That was the, the reality that we were facing, and it passed. And absent some lobbying level, lobbying at the governor level that got the governor, uh, you know, luckily a fairly business-minded governor to, to, to veto that statute, that's where we'd be today. We'd be sitting here in Georgia with a law worse than the CFAA or the Georgia version of the Computer Crimes Act. It, it really does create that type of, of Restriction much more easy to draft than a than a broad uh, a broadening or an allowance. So it really does behoove everyone to be involved at the political level because that is the thing that you're facing. We can try to push for good law, but we have to at the very least push against the bad law. Let me go to questions here. It sounds like um, through the bug bounty programs, private companies have kind of figured out a good balance uh, with respect to the research and the reporting and, and the risk. So for the CF CFAA, for example, uh, why not take those, those, those contracts as a template to build a sort of um, a safe harbor in the CFAA rather than trying to find that exact fine line in the crime itself, why not create a safe harbor using that, that template? That's a, that's a really good question, and it comes up a, a, a lot. Um, and I'm going to uh, jump on those other people may have some points of view. But um, there's a real challenge in making a good safe harbor. Um, so I mean, the, the broad concept that you know we want the white hats to be to be okay. Uh, 
Um, you know, you can you can agree on that. Of course, that sounds great. We should do that. Uh, but there's problems with drafting in it. So as as uh, we were discussing earlier, there's the the uh, color of the hat may not become clear until uh, until the point of, of disclosure, and sometimes a vendor may say, "Oh, even then, uh, it is it is un unclear." Um, there's you know someone's using a metaphor, so I guess if you found like a bag of cocaine and you were going to bring it to the police station, if you get stopped along the way saying, "Well, I was headed to the police station," probably it's still going to be kind of bad for you. Uh, but once you get to the police station, maybe it's it's all right to ha hand it in at that point. Um, there, there's there's the uh, negative implication. So if you create a statutory safe harbor, they may create the sort of the negative implication that if you don't do all the things in that safe harbor, therefore you are a bad person and <coughs> should be prosecuted. Should be such. And so creating a uh, a safe harbor that doesn't capture all the things that we like, well then the negative implication it can be harmful. Uh, and then crafting it to capture everything that we like, well, then there may be examples of, of things that, that nevertheless in that de uh, definition don't don't work. So we have some examples of this for, um, oh, I'll wrap this up quickly. We're running low on time. Uh, Digital Millennium Copyright Act, it, it makes it a, 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 you know unlawful to uh, break uh, uh, things that, that protect copyrights. Um, and there's a security research exemption to it, which I don't think anyone has ever successfully used. Um, you know, it, 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 uh, uh, they went through this process, they tried to make a safe harbor, they acknowledged that there were these security research concerns and they went into the, the statute, and it was sort of terrible. And I think I'm, I'm sort of out of time to say why it was terrible, but it just, it wasn't useful. And I've seen other safe harbors that essentially boil down to if you don't violate the law, you're a safe harbor. That like they'll have like get authorization from the vendor, and I'm like, well, that's an element of the crime as well, so that's not much of a of a safe harbor. So anyway, that's a challenge. Thank you. Okay, um, so I live in Virginia. If I wanted to contact Senator Warner about the carve out that he's working on, is there a particular message that would be good to pass on to him? Um, in the interest of time, let's talk afterward, and we can talk about that. <laughs> Thank you. But so there you go. That's what I was saying. Contact your senator, contact your representative, contact your local politicians. Stay involved. You're going to hear me say that at every single one of my panels. You've heard me say it for every single panel I've been on for the last, I don't even know how many years I've been talking for the FF. Uh, but lots of, of times I've said that. So be sure to stay involved. I, I did want to make sure you guys know that the Hilton downstairs has a table registering voters. If you're not registered, go register. If your friends aren't registered, go register them. It's a young lady back there who will clearly register you. So go, go register to vote, be involved, call your senators, and, and, and be active in creating good law and challenging bad law. Okay. All right. I just wanted to give a, a, a big shout out, though, for, for the work that Electronic Frontiers Georgia did on the SB 315. Please give them a hand. That was tremendous work and very successful. Oh, is that a wrap? Okay, that's a wrap. <laughs> Thank, All right. you Thank you, everybody. Coming at 10 in the morning. Talk about this. First panel of the.